Meet Hugh of House Janus, an Empire citizen in his 20s, a lowly peasant and the son of urban merchants known for his leadership skills and time spent working under the table, at the docks, and on various construction sites. He doesn't do anything particularly exceptional, just another face in a sea of people, and this is precisely why Hugh of House Janus is the protagonist of our story. Hugh's flag is decorated with a giant white P to signify his massive pe call for world peace. Yes, that's it. Together, we'll start as a measly peasant, assisting our local village with their trivial predicaments until the Fire Nation attacks. Oh, wait. Wrong story. Anyway, we'll start as a peasant, meet an incredibly powerful adversary, and make it our sole purpose in life to defeat them in combat, destroy their faction, and take over their lands, becoming a king. I'll be playing on Iron Man mode with Battle Death for all heroes enabled. With that, let's get into it. Just a city boy, born and raised in South Danustica. He took his sumpter horse going to Tegrasis. Which I'm assuming is the medieval version of Tegrity Farms. I don't know, I'm pretty sure that's how the song goes. Just kidding, this place sucks. As we explored a village to settle down in, we came across a group of four highwaymen leading to our first taste of combat. Along with two companions, Hugh took on the highwaymen, killing three of them relatively easily. When it came to the remaining horsemen, we baited him into a charge by dancing to the YMCA. After stopping to rest in Lanthus, Hugh agreed to help the townsfolk deal with a nearby bandit camp. Before going in, he swung by a few other towns to gather a small team of peasants to lead into battle. Of course, before we could make it to the camp, we were intercepted by some mountain bandits. Bandits dealt with, we reached the bandit camp and hid until nightfall. The raid went pretty smoothly, all things considered. All the bandits were spaced out, allowing us to just overwhelm them. We did have our first casualty during the raid though, with a peasant taking a javelin to the face while we charged down the river. He may have been the first, but he will not be the last. A willing sacrifice to keep the surrounding town safe from merciless killers. When we finally encountered the bandit leader, Yu, wounded from the ongoing raid, chose to deny a 1v1, leading to a final stand. A choice Hugh would live to regret. While the majority of the raid was an easy run, the brigands were organized now, and much better geared. Consequently, the peasants were utterly slaughtered, leaving Hugh as the sole survivor. Having barely escaped the bandit camp, Hugh crawled to a nearby village where he rested for a few days until he was able to stand on his own again. The first thing he did was head to Oneira to recruit some more peasants, purchase an axe, and enough food to survive for a few days on the road. With a party of 15 farmers, we set out to explore the various towns and provide aid as needed. We're down to our last few coins, so if we don't manage to find some work, well, we likely won't survive the summer. That being said, work is not hard to find around here. Almost immediately, we accepted a contract to deal with a few bandit patrols that were making life hell in the area. Hello. Luckily for us, looters are about as armed as our group, but much less organized. So, even when we're attacked by multiple groups and outnumbered, the fight still tends to easily tip in our favor. Thank <laughs> you. 
550 dinars richer, we actually made more money from selling the gear to the townsfolk. The next morning, we grabbed a similar quest from the nearby town of Parasemnus, the same town that saved Hugh's life just two days earlier. Unfortunately, these guys weren't looters, but mountain bandits instead. Honestly, I was expecting way more casualties. In reality, this was an incredibly one-sided fight. One of the highlights here was the beheading of the bandit leader as the final kill of the fight, no doubt inspiring our followers who would spread the word of our heroics to the surrounding villages. With our quest completed, we returned to town and sold the additional gear to the villagers. We now have two successful bandit quests completed, so I decided to change focus and attempt our most lucrative contract yet. Over the course of several days, Hugh and his band of misfit farmers would be escorting a merchant caravan serving as Walmart brand bodyguards, earning 350 dinars per day. We were hoping for a peaceful ride, but raiders attacked on our first day. Even though we outnumbered them by 10 men, we were undergeared, leaving this to an even fight. By the end of the battle, Hugh's party did not suffer a single casualty, whereas the caravan lost five soldiers with another wounded. After making a quick pit stop at an eastern city, we encountered a second raider party. This fight turned south almost immediately, when the caravan leader took the Dothrakian approach of just blindly charging into the enemy, who slaughtered him almost immediately. With no other support, we were able to take down a couple raiders before Hugh was knocked unconscious and pulled away from the battlefield. Rather than re-engaging the raiders, we just chose to abandon the mission and retreat back to the Empire-controlled territories. At this point, we spent most of the summer fighting bandits and raiders. Not the worst way to make some cash, but for now, I decided to take a short break from that and accepted a quest to bring in some cattle to assist the villagers of Odriza. We were able to purchase the cows from a small eastern village before returning to Odriza the following day. We received payment in meat instead of cash, which we could either sell or keep. Since I hate having to worry about food, it made far more sense for me to just keep the food. Now that we've had a few days to recover, it's back to hunting down bandits. These have become common practice for us and are often resolved without needing to set foot on the battlefield. The following season, after a full month of fighting bandits, Hugh decided to try his hand in an arena tournament. This was an enormous gamble. No, literally, we bet 1500 dinars on winning the first round, so failure here would risk leaving the party broke. After the first round, I threw another 1500 on Hugh, effectively stacking 3000 dinars for a chance to win 12,000. On the third round, I threw in what little cash we had left, bringing our stake up to 3,655 dinars for a chance to win 13,179. It all led up to the final round. Hugh of House Janus against Ulbus of Pethrus, a noble family currently serving as a high-ranking official in the Southern Empire. With Olbus defeated, Hugh had officially won his first tournament, 13,000 dinars richer and a 5,300 dinar bonus for winning the entire tournament, we now had more money than we'd ever seen before. This would also serve to spread the name of Hugh Janus throughout the lands. 
A peasant fighting with a pitchfork, building a legacy by helping townsfolk and winning a tournament against one of the Southern Empire's most decorated nobles. Even with all that, we still needed to hit clan level 1, so it was back to delivering cows and fighting bandits. After spending most of autumn spamming these activities, word was slowly starting to spread. One more big feat should be enough to allow us to join the ranks as a mercenary. With that, we settled on a caravan ambush. With the ambush completed, we're now officially Clan Tier 1, and able to serve the Southern Empire as a mercenary. You could think of no greater honor than to have the ability to continue to aid the surrounding towns and cities. He wouldn't have to wait long before getting his first taste of large-scale combat either. Shortly after joining up with an army, they were attacked by the Northern Empire while trying to provide aid to the surrounding towns, leading to the ensuing battle. To call this fight a bloodbath would be nothing short of an understatement. The army of the Southern Empire was completely decimated, leaving only 28 survivors, all of which were taken prisoner. While in captivity, the Southern lands were razed. Armies of the Northern Empire ravaged the area unchecked, slaughtering thousands and destroying several towns that he had dedicated his life to protecting, with one man to blame. Lucan must be stopped. After spending several days at the John McCain experience, he was able to escape and make his way back to Saronea to recover. Now that Hugh of House Janus was safe from the northern assailants, we could focus on the actual important things, fame and fortune. As the responsible gamblers say, always ride the hot hand and always double down. For some reason, this tried and true method just didn't seem to work this time around, and I ended up taking a sharpened steel object to the side of the temple. In total, this cost me 6,000 dinars, and my pride. <laughs> Safe to say, morale was at an all-time low. With no story at the bottom of the bottle, I struggled to find anyone to follow me. Even when I was able to channel my inner girl boss and convince some farmers to join my multi-level marketing job, we walked directly into a group of mountain bandits who crammed their no-soliciting sign through our skulls before taking Hugh prisoner. 
Once again, we managed to escape and drag ourselves to a nearby city of Oneira, where we could repeat the cycle of intensively gambling on ourselves in a local tournament. You know what they say, folks. 100% of quitters always stop right before they hit it big. This time was no exception, as Hugh Janus was able to cut through his opponents with ease, successfully securing a monetary reward of 5,500 dinars, along with a payout of over 17,000 in earnings from his placed bets. With a big payout under my belt, I sought out another tournament over in Lyseran. These are getting easier and easier as I continue to flesh out my skills some more, and the renown from winning these are a little nice bonus added on. That being said, the real reward comes from this early form of sports betting. On average, we're earning three times more from betting than we are from outright winning the tournament. While Hugh spent his time focusing on fame and glory, the Northern Empire was beginning to spread into the south. Not only had they taken Oneira, but they'd managed to capture several castles while also destroying dozens of villages in the area. With that in mind, I retreated to the safest place I could think of, Bostrom. Bostrom is a port city in the south. It's deep in the Southern Empire territory and out of the way, making it an unlikely target so early on in the war. The surrounding villages are fairly prosperous as well, so recruiting soldiers shouldn't be much of an issue. Over the next few days, I passed the time by hitting up several towns to bolster my numbers. I even went out to Poros, another Southern Empire city, to see who I could all recruit. Now that we have over a hundred soldiers in our ranks, even though most are simple peasants and farmers, I felt much more secure and even decided to join the Queen's army. I figured what better way to train my troops than to have them learn from the best. This logic was very flawed, however. Almost as soon as we joined Regea's army, we were engaged by a northern war party. We outnumber them, but it's important to remember that almost a hundred troops are simple townsfolk wielding pitchforks and clubs. Still, I felt confident. As soon as the battle started, we were on the defensive end, choosing to hide in the trees and start speaking Vietnamese. Surprisingly though, these tactics did seem to work, at least initially. We were losing men fast, but as soon as the enemy overstepped, we were able to capitalize on their mistakes, charging into their line. He was able to take out a few horsemen, even stealing a horse in the process and generally focusing on their archers. If we could just take them out, it'd be an easy victory. The only problem with that is that if you're the only person targeting the archers, well, they're just gonna focus you down. And as soon as Hugh was out of commission, it felt like the fight just immediately went down the shitter. Just look at the death counter in the top right. I chose to retreat from the fight and hopefully re-engage by simming the battle, but it was no use. For the third time in less than a year, Hugh of House Janus was taken prisoner. This time, he was able to break out after only a day or two and make his way to a nearby city that I have no idea how to pronounce. Naturally, as soon as we got there and realized they were hosting a tournament, well, we had to join it. It feels like the monetary rewards have been slowly decreasing as we've climbed the leaderboards, but the earnings from the bets are making up for that. This time bringing in almost 17,000 from bets alone. Now I see why they were distracting their townsfolk with silly tournaments. With nowhere to go, we stared down the shit show that was about to unfold in front of us. Outnumbered 3 to 1 with minimal defenses. Our only hope was that we could hold them off the walls long enough to force a retreat and then just pray the army disbands afterwards. It's a long shot, but what else was there to do other than hope? Look at how lopsided the odds are. This is like a WNBA team going up against the f***ing Globetrotters. Anyway, we don't have any catapults or trebuchets or anything like that. All we do have are some militia archers and barrels of arrows. I simply waited for one of the archers to take one to the face and then picked up his gear to aid in the defense, even though I never touched a bow so far. How hard could it be though? Luckily, I was able to kill a few of the attackers before their battering ram reached the front gates. 
I have no idea how the walls are doing, but if they do breach the gate, this battle is over. Luckily for me, there were some rocks piled up nearby that I could use to chuck at my enemies. While this did boost some empty stats, it ultimately helped nothing as the gates were breached. At this point, there wasn't really anything else that could be done, so I followed the remaining soldiers down to the streets for a final stand. In total, we killed a whopping 70 men, with 17 of them coming from Hue. To add insult to injury, just two days after losing the city, we made peace with the Northern Empire. Meaning, had we been able to hold out just two days longer, we could have avoided this entire catastrophe. My immediate thoughts on the peace treaty were, thank god I can get my feet up under me now. But honestly, the longer I thought about it, the more I was filled with blind rage towards Lucan and his nobles in the north. They'd taken everything from Hue, and every time he tried to fight back, They'd slapped him to the side like an annoying fly or an unwanted stepchild. Not the ones that get stuck in washing machines, the other ones. This is all a roundabout way of me saying, I'm gunning for him. He may not even know I exist, but I know he's got several castles, cities, a son, a daughter, and a wife. Equipped with that information, my end goal is to destroy him, his legacy, and any semblance of his existence. This is a long-term goal, though. It's important to remember that I'm a simple mercenary at the moment. Still clan tier 1 and still dealing with secondhand weaponry, usually leading an army of peasants. I'll need to get my name out there more, and the best way to do that is to simply start winning battles. With a rising clan tier, I can begin recruiting companions to lead their own parties as well as join the southern empire as a noble. This will help me build up influence that can be used to lead massive armies deep into northern controlled territory. It's a political game on par with Chancellor Palpatine's plans in the Star Wars prequels, if I do say so myself. After spending most of the summer rebuilding my party, a perfect opportunity presented itself. The Kuzates had declared war on the Southern Empire. This is normally none of my concern, but if I can assist with some sieges, maybe take on a couple nobles, my renown and influence should skyrocket. So that's just what I did. The first battle I was able to take part in came in the form of defending a small town from being ransacked. After the battle, I donated my prisoners to the Odriza castle, since I didn't have any need for them at the moment and they'd only really slow me down. As the season changed, we were presented with an opportunity to assist in sieging a castle. This lasted for about a day, until a group of Kuzate nobles made their way over to intervene. Seeing the writing on the wall, we fled with our troops and managed to make a deal with the nobles to leave the area instead of being taken prisoner again. This, in turn, left me totally broke and likely damaged relations with the nobles and the army that we'd left for dead. Regardless, I'm broke now, or at least momentarily. I was able to sell some of the gear I'd earned from previous battle and recoup a portion of my losses that went towards feeding and paying my soldiers. Since I was the only party from that group to retain my army, I figured the best way to assist in the war efforts would be to simply begin hunting down nobles. I tried to target easy battles that I felt like I had an advantage in, and that strategy tended to pay off rather quickly. Ideally, I'd like to simulate the fights, but I figured the surefire way to secure victory was by participating in them. Usually, they'd go something like this. Spawn in, run around for a bit, knock an enemy soldier off their horse, steal said horse, target cavalry and archers until they routed. If you're wondering why I couldn't be bothered to simply purchase my own mount and ride into battle on that one instead of stealing one, well, the answer is actually pretty simple. You gain athletics XP from traversing the map on foot, so anytime I travel anywhere on the map, I'm gaining athletics XP. Not only does this make me faster in combat, but it also gives me more health. Then, if I want a horse, all I need to do is wait for someone to fall off of theirs. Over the following days, I managed to win two battles before a peace treaty was signed. 
I'm a lot closer to Clan Tier 2, but we're still just not quite there yet. To reduce the cost of our wages, I ended up donating most of my veteran troops to various cities. This is basically the Medieval Times equivalent of the massive game dev layoffs that have been happening over the last few months. It may save money up front, but overall horrendously costly down the line. After selling all the gear that we'd looted from the battles, we're back up to over 22k. Not a big enough amount to really flex with, but certainly enough to build up an army at a moment's notice. During these down periods of peace, I tried to focus on tournaments. They're an easy way to earn 20k quickly, while also boosting my renown. They're also just something I really enjoy about Bannerlord, to be honest. It also helps when the prizes are high tier as well. This horse, for example, is worth 17k, so in reality, not only did I make 22,000 dinars from the tournament, but if I sell the horse, I'm walking away with a 39k profit from a 5 minute side objective. As winter came, so did our next opportunity. The city of Akalot, a Kuzate city taken in the war, launched a rebellion, declaring war on the southern empire, and I was more than happy to indulge. Funny enough, this was the first siege I was able to take part of that actually worked out. We began the assault with a hefty advantage, and that would carry over. That being said, we took heavy casualties early on. The city's defenses were incredibly powerful, including several catapults that were able to crush dozens of soldiers with a single volley. One of the more extreme cases of this came when they managed to destroy one of our siege towers. This is why you always bring two. Only having to defend one wall is a massive advantage to the defenders, but our battering ram was still up, so as long as we could draw attention away from the main gate, the outcome shouldn't really be affected. My big focus wasn't even securing the walls, we'll let the soldiers handle that. For Hugh, the focus lay in destroying the catapults. As long as they were standing, we were risking massive casualties. main catapult destroyed, I turned back to see that we'd fully secured the walls. From that point on, the fight was over. I mean, they really didn't stand a chance. By the end of the battle, the casualties on both sides were about even, but the highlight came in the fact that Hugh's party was able to kill 44 men while only suffering 8 deaths and 9 injuries. With the rebellion quelled, Hugh purchased a new two-handed axe to celebrate. Honestly, it was time for an upgrade. This one's better in almost every way. It's got 4 less swing speed and 3 less handling, but it deals 21 more cut damage and has a 104 length as opposed to a 78 from the Sparth Axe. I'm excited to see what we can do with this bad boy. Back to peaceful times, however. I continued my tournament grind, winning another in Cyrenea and walking away 21k richer. After winning that tournament, I hit up another tavern where I was able to recruit my first companion of the playthrough. Dalitus the Bull can fight on his own with one and two handed combat skills, all being 100 plus, and he also has decent tactics starting at 60. My plan for him is to have him run his own party so that when I can raise armies, he'll be able to join for free, offering several hundred troops at no cost to myself. It's important to remember that nobles and companions can be killed in combat though, and I don't want to take any chances with that, so I spent about 19k gearing him up. After spending several thousand dinars on food for my troops, I entered the arena, this time as a group. I figured the game would just match whatever I went in with, so I only chose Dalitus leaving the other four slots empty. Well, you can imagine my surprise when we walked into our first round of the tournament to find that we were the only duo. It's entirely my fault for not researching the mod more thoroughly, but safe to say I learned the hard way that you should always go into group tournaments with a full team. After losing thousands of dinars, I needed a way to recover and take a little break from tournaments. This came in the form of another caravan ambush, which I was happy to accept. Funny enough, as soon as we wrapped up the quest, the Southern Empire declared war on the Azerai, a desert faction in the south. Before diving into that, I swung by Vostrum to win another tournament, even though I just said I was going to take a break.
This win was special though, as it finally pushed us up to clan tier 2. If you're new to Bannerlord, that means we can now become a noble for any major faction and allow a companion to form a party. The big appeal of becoming a noble is that you can earn properties such as cities or castles from wars. You also have the ability to raise an army with enough influence. That's what I'm most excited for. With that, I gave Dalitus his own party and supplied him with enough troops to get started on his own escapades. In the meantime, we'll continue to take any fights that I like our chances on. And by that, of course, I mean when we run into the Sultan of the Azerai people, we immediately launch into battle, regardless of how undermanned we are. I should have known right away this wasn't a fight we'd be able to win. By the time Hugh was knocked out, they'd killed almost 150 men while we were at a measly 67. Luckily, we were able to retreat and regroup, at which point Hugh simply said, f*** this shit, I'm out, and ran for the hills. We still have over 70 men, so recovering shouldn't be that painful. It'll just take a few rounds through Vostrom and the surrounding villages. Over the next few weeks, I spent my time recovering from the loss. It wasn't until summer that I saw my next battle. This time, I would have to take my first real solo battle. Emir Elias and his party of 114 soldiers against Hugh of House Janus and his party of 164 soldiers. Sergeants, take command. We're still undergeared and dealing with freshly recruited villagers, but I still had hope that we'd be able to pull this off. After watching my lines get absolutely decimated, I pulled back and was able to escape, leaving a portion of my forces behind as a diversion. As I retreated to Vostrum, I noticed a familiar face charging into the battle. Dalitus had shown up with a full party and engaged Elias. Partially because I couldn't just let him fight alone, and partially for redemption, we turned around and joined the battle, winning it with ease. Over the course of the summer, we strung together several big wins. It was a nice change of pace after getting steamrolled by the Northern Empire just a year ago. We even got in on a siege of Tamnu Castle. This one was a ton of fun to participate in, and I'm glad I played it and didn't just sim. From my experience, you typically lose about 75% of your army if you sim the castle and city assaults, but if you play them out, they tend to go much smoother. In this instance, I kept up with the same tactics I employed earlier, where I scaled the walls and then took out the catapults. These types of victories usually come with massive payouts in terms of influence and the share of loot, making them very lucrative investments. Immediately after taking the castle, I assisted the army in two additional battles that were won handedly. At this point, I wanted to raise my own army, but remembered I'm still just a mercenary. So I sought out the queen to become a noble and pledge my services to her. Now this may be considered a complete dick move, and it was seemingly out of spite, but as soon as I became a noble, our loving queen made peace with the Azerites, causing me to donate most of my veterans to a city garrison and losing out on the ability to form an army. It took a few days to locate and travel to her, but upon reaching the keep, I took a How to Become a Riz God course for the low cost of $5,000, and started trying out some tactics on Zoanna, Lugan's only daughter.
Sadly, I failed on the final attempt, and in Bannerlord, it's all or nothing. This means the only way I'll be able to marry her now is by paying her dad, my sworn enemy, most of my cash. Turns out those Russian wife buying sites do have some history to them, evidently dating back to medieval times. I don't know if he's really that stingy or if he's just trying to make me hate him even more, but apparently 82 grand isn't enough to marry Lukan's daughter. So back to tournaments. It may have taken 90,000 dinars and all of my pride and ego, but finally I was able to marry Zoanna, making Lukan my father-in-law. Our queen must have read my diary, because as soon as she saw step 1 was checked off, she voted to declare war on the Northern Empire, effectively beckoning for me to make my push for ultimate revenge. If you find yourself questioning if Lukan truly is the villain in the story, well, he took his own daughter prisoner as soon as the war started, so whose side are you on? You want to side with the peasant hero Hugh of House Janus, or are you riding with Lukan, projector of daddy issues and superiority complex? Yeah, that's what I thought. Before we get into the crazy war crimes though, I need cash. And if you've been paying any attention at all, you'd know my method of obtaining some. While the winnings from this tournament were enough to hire on 230 soldiers to join me, it wasn't nearly enough to maintain them. The only way I could think to continue paying them at this rate was to pull off some successful raids, so with that, I used my influence to raise a decent sized army and began targeting castles. Time is of the essence, and I didn't have the luxury of waiting to destroy the castle's defenses, and instead chose to craft a battering ram before throwing bodies at the wall. We outnumbered them 3 to 1, but they had full strength walls and defenses, while we were forced to scale the walls with wooden ladders. Taking the walls felt nearly impossible, but it was vital to get the ladders up as quickly as possible. The longer we took to scale the walls, the more soldiers were taken out by catapults. Similar to the previous assaults, the goal centered around taking out said catapults. This is much easier said than done, considering you need to get onto the walls first, survive the initial fight, clear out the archers, locate the catapults, and then make your way over to them, all without taking a spear to the head. As Hugh focused on the defenses, our forces stormed the main gates. When the dust finally settled, our first army-led siege was a success, though at a cost of nearly two-thirds of our men. A sacrifice I was more than willing to make for the payoff of being granted my very own castle. While we focused on recruiting more soldiers, I noticed that Cyronea was under siege. This city had given me so much when I first started out, and now stood as a pillar of green amidst the hordes of red castles and towns surrounding it. Since we had the clear advantage, I charged towards the attackers, destroying their attempted siege and taking several nobles prisoner. While all of this was going on, my castle had also been under siege. Had I ignored Cyronea, I might have saved the castle. Those few days spent in combat and recovering came back to bite me in the ass, considering it was overtaken just as we set foot at its gates. Naturally, we immediately sieged the recently taken castle again. I thought we'd be able to take it without issue since I didn't waste any time building siege engines and instead focused on simply brute forcing the depleted troops hiding behind the walls.
My overconfidence got the best of me here, and I charged in, only to be overwhelmed and forced to retreat within a few minutes. We had the numbers to give it another go, but while Hugh was recovering and preparing to lead another assault, his army was counterattacked by several reinforcements. I would know your name. With a weakened army and no general, our forces fell, resulting in the three of us being taken prisoner and thrown into the dungeons at a nearby city. Hugh was eventually able to escape after spending several days taking the Martha Stewart experience, and as soon as he was able to, we began rebuilding the party. We'd lost everything. All of our supplies, our soldiers, our horses. It'd take time, but I'm confident we'll recover. And over the next week, that's exactly what we did. By the 4th of summer, 1087, we'd already recruited well over a hundred men. It was around this time that I noticed one of our castles being sieged. They were unnumbered by 150 men or so, and coincidentally, I just happened to have around that amount on me. Not wanting to see another castle fall to the Northern Empire, we devised a plan to sneak past the besiegers and join the defense. Now outnumbered by only 50 men, I was sure we could hold off the attackers, and for the next three days, we did just that, taking turns destroying each other's catapults. After spending three days getting nowhere, the Northern Army finally decided to begin their assault. The first thing I did was locate one of our catapults before taking it over for myself. It took a few practice shots to get the hang of things, but eventually, I was able to start dishing out pretty catastrophic damage. Initially, my goal was to take out the siege towers, but then I realized there's no point in having a siege tower if you don't have the manpower to scale the walls. So I quickly changed focus to the men behind the equipment instead of just damaging the tower itself. This was extremely effective, and only after a few minutes of this, we successfully routed our attackers. And at first glance, it appeared that around 180 men were able to escape. But Valeria, another southern noble, wasn't about to let that happen. She is a smaller party than my group, but together, we had a pretty even fight on our hands. Before engaging, I took a quick look at my troops and upgraded anyone I could to give us any additional help possible to tip the scale in our favor. The setup was pretty basic here as well. Put the archers in front and the swordsmen behind. When the enemy got too close, I'd move the swordsmen in front and drop the archers back so they could rain down arrows from relative safety. With the end results coming in, we managed to take out the entire party while only taking 15 casualties for ourselves. Just pure domination and a sight for sore eyes. It's a good feeling when you finally start winning some battles instead of just getting steamrolled like when he was just a mercenary. I'm not sure what the Northern Empire's obsession is with this castle, but I refuse to let it fall. While I initially considered charging out to meet the enemy, I figured why the fuck would I do that when I could just break through the siege and hide behind the castle walls with the other hundred or so men. So, that's exactly what I did. Once again, through the help of a trusty catapult, we were able to repel the attempted assault. Overall, a great summer and a huge win for the South. As summer turned to autumn, Hugh was greeted with the fantastic news that his wife, Zoanna, was pregnant with their first child. This has little to no impact on the remainder of the story, but it was still a happy point in Hugh's life, so I wanted to include it. A week after receiving the news, Hugh found himself leading an army of 800 men towards the gates of Oneira, with the goal of liberating the city that had been taken over two years ago. What I like to do is build trebuchets since they can one-shot catapults. If you're able to whittle them down, eventually you can build a full set of four trebuchets, which will start damaging the walls, all while preventing the defenders from crafting more defenses. This can take several days to start seeing results, but unfortunately, we don't have that kind of time. The Queen is already in negotiation talks with Lucan for peace, and we don't know when they'll be resolved, so it's now or never. Initially, we struggled, but so do the first waves of all attacking forces. The goal is to just take the walls before you lose too many men. While we were pushing in, Hugh tripped on an ice cube and flung himself all the way over to Weenie Hut Generals, forcing the assault to come to a screeching halt as we pulled back and regrouped. 
My plan was to lead a second attack once I healed enough, but that second attack never came to fruition. See, just before Hugh was healthy enough to set foot on the battlefield, the Northern and Southern Empires signed a peace treaty, ending our siege. Talk about a huge blow to morale, especially considering I was counting on the loot from this assault to carry me over until the following war started. Since that didn't happen, I ended up donating more troops to a local garrison to cut costs yet again. This was a weird chapter in Hugh's life. We kind of just went on a massive tournament bender after realizing I could just ask where other tournaments were being held and then go to the one I liked that gave the best monetary reward or the highest quality item. Basically, I spent a good year or so just traveling around the map competing. This helped me get to Clan Tier 3, begin rising up the leaderboards, and after about 7 victories, I had more dinars than I know what to do with. After winning another tournament in Poros, he was given a Tier 5 two-handed axe as a reward. I still like my sword better, but the axe has way more range on it, which will help a ton with sieges. We even added another companion to the clan, Kanazat the Wanderer. She's basically the exact same as Dalados, with the only difference being she's better on horseback. She also got some skill with pole arms, so it made sense to have her lead as part of the cavalry. Since we're clan tier 3 now, we can have 3 parties roaming around, which is enough for us to build an army just from our clan at the cost of zero influence. We'll be able to test this relatively quickly, since the west and southern empires are going to war. I do have 105 influence currently, so I should be able to recruit 3 or 4 nobles on top of the 2 in my clan. As if he needed another reason to fight, Hugh's first child was born on the 16th of winter, 1087. With the news out, I felt the need to earn a piece of land for myself. Currently, we didn't own any. The only castle I had a claim on was taken within the same month I earned it after choosing to defend Cyrenea. With that, I set my eyes on the nearby western cities. We have an army of over a thousand men, so we should be able to siege this rather successfully. Several days into the siege, we found ourselves in the perfect position. The enemy had no way of destroying our siege engines, and we had two towers, a battering ram, and several trebuchets. Initially, I tried to ride a siege tower into the wall, but glitched through the ladder and fell all the way to the ground, nearly killing me. In all honesty, I probably should have just pulled out and healed up instead of pushing ahead, but considering I'm a dad, pulling out isn't really in my vocabulary. Which means this can only end exactly how you're thinking it would. Alright, round two, let's get to it. Honestly, I lasted way longer than I thought I was going to. I'm not sure how Hugh just ate an arrow to the neck and shrugged it off like it was nothing, but I'm just not going to ask any questions. Okay, okay, okay. Third time's the charm. It was probably a good thing, but I didn't really have to do all that much this fight. Just kind of sat back and watched the forces clash at the openings in the walls. It wasn't until we broke through the walls that Hugh started racking up the kills. Likely because they weren't focused on him at all, but I'll take any opportunity to pad my stats. I didn't think it'd take three assaults to take the city, but I'm happy we got it. Now all that's left to do is vote on who it's for. To pass the time while waiting, I joined in on a nearby castle siege until the vote went through and the city was signed over to Hugh of House Janus. Obviously, as soon as I got the news, I abandoned the siege and went back to check out the place. It's got about half of the projects completed, which was really nice to see. To help stabilize the place and keep her out of danger, I assigned Zoanna to be the governor. I mean, it's 1087, people. We're progressive. We're not stoning women for showing ankle. At least I don't, I don't think. Anyway, once the city was set up and running efficiently, I headed back to Thorius Castle to go give them a hand. 
and good god was it needed. As soon as I set foot on the battlefield, I watched a massive group of soldiers and the flag carrier get f***ing obliterated by a catapult shot. Great start to the fight. This is one of those battles where you get to see what happens when you don't take out the catapults before assaulting. Not only did they melt away over a hundred soldiers, but they destroyed both siege towers, resulting in us having to use ladders to scale the walls. And even then, they put up such a tough fight on the walls that the catapults were allowed to continue unchecked for several minutes. Regardless, it was worth it to see just how much influence and loot we were earning from these sieges. When it came time for the vote, I chose to play the politics game instead of voting for myself. For 20 influence, I'd be able to boost relations with 6 different nobles, which is really going to help me out down the road. Not only will this make them cheaper to bring into my army in the future, but if I ever decide to secede from the south, I may be able to take a few of these guys with me. We've got the upper hand in this war so far though, so I wanted to keep the pressure on. With all the influence I've been earning, he was able to raise a second army of over a thousand men and go on an absolute tear through the west. First, we hit Rote, one of the western empire's largest cities and a central hub for trading. The battle itself was incredibly fast, lasting only around 5 minutes. During that time, we took less than 100 casualties while dishing out over 400. Rote in southern control, we targeted the nearby city of Yalmers, or however the fuck you pronounce it. The goal was simply to whittle them down with our trebuchets and then overwhelm them with our numbers, but sadly, we never got the chance. I don't know what it is with the queen and making peace with our enemies as we're about to take major settlements, but I'm about to write her a very strongly worded letter expressing my discontent. With the war over, he welcomed in his second child. Now with two children behind the walls, I took advantage of the peaceful times to continue building up our city. Also, I don't know if it's just because we're in-laws now, or if it's because he's a grandpa, but apparently Hugh and Lucan are friends now. At least Lucan thinks so. We've got him exactly where we want him. Continuing the politics game, I voted to declare war on the Sturgia. Do I have any interest in them? No. Am I planning on going out of my way to fight the pissed off Vikings in the north? No. In all honesty, I'm just living out my Thomas Shelby fantasy. It only costs 20 influence to continue building my reputation, which I can get back from something as simple as winning a siege battle over a castle. That being said, we need to make at least look like we're committed to the cause, so I took a chance early on when I saw Chastamir, inventor of the chastity belt, roaming the plains. I did choose to let him go though, since again, I have no interest in this war and it boosts relations with him. You ever make a decision that seems insignificant but ends up paying off almost immediately? Well, that's what happened here. Less than 10 days after battling the Sturgeons, I was patrolling the southern lands when Lucan declared war on the south. It's been 4 years, but I'm finally in a position to put my plans in motion. Everything has been building to this. We have a wife, a legacy and two children, and I'm a high ranking noble in a large faction. If anything should happen to Hugh, his legacy will live on. First things first, let's take back Oneira. Honestly, this may be the largest battle I've ever taken part in a Bannerlord campaign. Over 2200 men are involved in this. I needed to see this for myself, so I hopped in only to be immensely disappointed. I hate that every time I join a battle that I'm not leading, the entire strategy is to just go on the defensive and hide in the trees. This has never worked for us, so why would it start now? Now, in theory, this works because the Northern Empires will eventually overstep, and when the second waves are spawned in, Southern troops will spawn behind them, essentially surrounding the attackers. The problem with that is you gotta lose like 100 to 200 soldiers before that happens, so we're cutting off our nose despite our face. The trees also serve as double-edged swords here. Sure, it's harder for cavalry to charge and the archers are more inaccurate, but we also have cavalry and archers of our own. 
Regardless, I stayed the course, hopping on a horse and focusing on the enemy cavalry. Four minutes into the battle, kills were about even, which was concerning considering they had about 200 more men than us. At this rate, it's a battle of attrition, and we're losing. After almost 10 minutes of constant fighting, there were no battle lines. The entire forest was a giant free-for-all. We're also one blindside shot away from death, so it came as a massive surprise when the charge order was given. We had no way to stop their cavalry charges, but somehow we were just going to charge ahead and everything would be fine? Yeah, I don't, I don't think so. The reasoning was because the second wave of soldiers had spawned in. The only problem? Well, they were all f***ing archers. Hugh tried his best to split the lines so the South could organize, but all that came from it was him falling unconscious, and if you're wondering what the legendary Hugh Janus means to the morale of this army, well, just look at what happens once he goes down. Having failed miserably, we spent a few days in prison before breaking out and beginning the slow and arduous task of rebuilding an army. Hugh does have over 200 influence now, which means we have the capability to raise one of the largest armies in the history of the Southern Empire, and I intend to do just that. It's time to go hunting. Lucan tends to hide in the city of Diathma. It's his safety net, so we started there. Lo and behold, we've got him trapped. All that's left to do now is burn the city to the ground. Everything started out so well. I was fully convinced we had this in the bag. Until one of our trebuchets took the opportunity to turn me into Pat Tillman. That being said, our forces took the city even without Hugh leading the charge. A few soldiers managed to retreat back to the keep, but it only prolonged the inevitable. After taking a victory lap through the city, I decided to visit Lucan in the dungeons. Since he's a prisoner of the city, we'll need to roll the dice and hope we get lucky enough to be granted it. Otherwise, there's no way, at least to my knowledge, that we can take him from the dungeon. Talk about spitting in the face of your greatest warrior. It's one thing to lose in an honest vote, but to not even make the final three was just insulting. One thing I have noticed as I've been a noble is that the queen only tends to give land to those she keeps very close to her. I don't see myself getting any additional land outside of my city while I'm here. She either keeps them for herself or gives them to like one of three people, and Hugh isn't one of them. That being said, as frustrating as it is, we'll need to wait for Lucan to break out and then hunt him down all over again. Because this army was so massive, it took a considerable amount of influence to prevent issues with cohesion decay, which is just me saying we don't have enough influence to raise another army. Because of this, Hugh changed focus to help defend Cyrenea. We're only outnumbered by around 130 men, so this seemed like a winnable fight, especially considering Cyrenea has multiple catapults that we can take advantage of. It seems like they're only pushing one side of the walls too for some reason, so it made focusing them down much easier to deal with. As they reached the walls, I hopped off the catapult, picked up a bow, and started winging shots at the attackers. Unfortunately, I was the only one left on top of the tower. All the other archers had died. And once they noticed, well, it was open season. Just look at how much shit is on this pen. Spears, axes, you name it, they were throwing it. Anyway, the battle was beginning to turn in our favor. If we could just hold them off a little longer, I had no doubt they'd retreat. Unfortunately, I don't know the full layout of the streets and was chased into a dead end where he was taken out. Similar to that massive 2,000 person battle, once Hugh goes down, the fight is over. 
In total, the soldiers of Cyrenea killed 409 men, with Hugh's party alone taking out 202 of them. Literally half of the enemy casualties were attributed to Hugh's party. Unfortunately, none of that matters, as after almost five years, the city of Cyrenea had officially fallen to the Northern Empire. After escaping the dungeons, we once again found ourselves starting from scratch. It would take most of the summer to recover from our losses, but some good did come out of this. Well, this was pure luck, but while recruiting soldiers, I walked face first into a battle between Lucan and several southern nobles. I took the opportunity and charged in, helping the nobles capture Lucan. I'm not sure why, but they let me walk away with Lucan as my prisoner. From there, it was a race back to our city for a public execution. But Lucan had one last trick up his sleeve. This was the first crash of the playthrough, so I wasn't too worried about it, but when I hopped back in, the game had rolled back to before the battle, meaning Lucan was free to continue roaming Calradia. This lit a fire under me, and I went on a rampage, targeting northern parties in the area and decimating their troops. During this time, I was able to improve relations with the northern nobles while taking the mercenary teams prisoner. During one of these battles, I even took on two parties at the same time, winning and freeing a few southern nobles in the process. I'm not sure if it was just luck or because I'm beginning to improve relations with everyone, but I was able to learn of Lucan's son's location. If I couldn't have the king, I'd take his only son. The battle was relatively one-sided as I expected it to be. Lucan's son hid behind the castle walls, but nothing was going to prevent us from tearing them down. This is where the big brain play comes in, and it's one I'm actually really proud of myself for realizing. Since I wasn't part of the army that sieged the castle, I didn't get a chance to catch any nobles. Luckily for us, Bannerlord took the writing straight out of The Rise of Skywalker because somehow Lucan's son managed to escape and join Serenor's army. Baranor was leading the army of the south, so I jumped in to assist. They already had the numbers advantage and were likely to win without Hugh's interference, but I figured it couldn't hurt to give them an extra 170 soldiers to work with. Good thing we did join though, as Hugh's party accounted for half of the kills. Are you starting to notice a pattern here? Alright, well, here's where the big brain play came in. I know a Siron is somebody's prisoner, and since they aren't in the castle yet, it means he's in someone's party and not in a dungeon, so I started talking to the nobles in the area before finding out Joran was holding him. You may recognize Joran from the various tournaments, as he's usually the one always making it to the finals against Hugh. That's not important though, what is important is that I have influence, and I can use that influence to both disband the current army, and then raise an army of my own. Only this one is exclusive, and only consists of Hugh and Joran. Once Joran is in my army, I can control where he goes and what cities he enters. Say, a player-owned city where he's inclined to donate his prisoners to the dungeons. And if Hugh just so happened to own that city, he could take prisoners from the dungeon and transfer them to his own party. Which would then allow for a, I don't know, public execution? That is unless the game decides to crash again. Luckily, I learned from Lucan's attempt and remembered to save before attempting the execution. At this point, I had a sneaking suspicion that this was happening due to the improved executions mod, so after turning that off and relaunching the game, I gave it another shot. Talk about kicking the hornet's nest. Holy shit, that pissed off so many people. I'm hoping that pissed off Lucan enough to overstep, and when he does, we can swoop in and take him out too. I need some more influence before raising another large-scale army, so instead I chose to join another army and help siege some cities. This was one of the bloodier battles of the playthrough. We had a clear number advantage, but that doesn't really matter if the defenders can destroy your siege equipment, forcing you back to using ladders.
After hours of fighting, we decided to pull back and regroup. By the end of the first assault, over 800 casualties had been taken on both sides. Just a massacre. We still had a clear advantage, so when it came time for the second assault, I felt comfortable just sending in my troops while Hugh hung back to heal up. We didn't stop there though, choosing to hit another castle before finally disbanding. He was up over 400 influence now, and to be honest, I think that might be enough to recruit like 75% of all the nobles in the Southern Empire. Had he not been shoved to the side and passed over for the last few years, he might have joined in on the war against the Kazates, but since they don't seem to care about Hugh of House Janus, why should he care about them? Especially after he'd come so close to enacting his revenge. Why stop just short? We've got unfinished business here. Unfortunately, I'll have to wait yet again, as the Queen decided to make peace with Lucan. It's probably for the best considering how long we've been going on here and now that we're fighting the Kazates in the East, but still, like, come on, just let me have something nice for once. I figured the fastest way to get back on track would be to eliminate the Kuzates as quickly as possible. They have two major cities and a handful of castles remaining. The sooner we take those, the faster they'll surrender. And with that, we slowly began dismantling the Kuzates. By that summer, we'd have finally closed in on their final castle. I've been simming the battles, but considering this one is pretty close, I thought it'd be better to just go boots on the ground and get my hands a little dirty. The issue wouldn't be the castle's defensive weapons for once, but instead the sheer amount of men they had ready to defend it. Both sections of the walls were completely destroyed, so we should just be able to flood in. Pair that with the fact that our catapults have pinpoint accuracy and are able to thread the needle of a hole in the wall, all while not hitting a single one of our soldiers, and all we need to do is sit back and wait. When I got bored of that, I jumped on the battering ram and helped the soldiers break through the front gate. This wasn't really needed, but having an extra point of entry that needs defending will certainly help thin the lines out. To give them some respect, the Kuzates put up one hell of a fight. We suffered heavy casualties taking this stronghold, but at the end of the day, the Southern Empire flag was raised and the Kuzates were no more. We're up over 650 influence now, so I think it's time we put it to good use. After the Empire declared war on the Sturgeons again, I raised a massive army and acted as if we were going to make a big push into Sturgeon-controlled territory. In reality, we were preparing for something far more advantageous to our cause. As we closed in on the city of Argaron, I reached out to the consul and, at the cost of a hundred influence, proposed a declaration of war against the Northern Empire. Years of kissing ass and raising relations with the nobles had led to this moment, and with overwhelming support, we prepared for war. Well, we had already been preparing. When you have the benefit of catching your enemy off guard, it allows you to do something like this. We currently outnumber Argaron 5 to 1. The only downside is that Lucan isn't here though, but I know someone who is. Equipped with that information, we assaulted Argaron with 1,700 troops for a chance to find Lucan's wife. This was a slaughter, an absolute bloodbath. We pillaged the city, cutting off escapes for the retreating soldiers and leaving no survivors.
With the battle over, I noticed that Zerasaka had escaped. No worries though, she couldn't have gotten far. It took less than a day to track her down and corner her party. Up against an army of 1400 soldiers, Zerasaka put up an attempted final stand with a party 10% of the size. We lost less than 10 men in the ensuing battle, but once again, she managed to escape. This time, our intelligence pointed us to the Atrion Castle. As we made our way over to siege the fortress, I did take notice that Hugh's influence was beginning to pay off. We now have two cities under our control and over 400k in the bank. Atrion Castle was no different than the dozens of others we'd stormed over the years. First, we took out their defenses, then their walls, and after crushing their morale, over a thousand soldiers flooded into the stronghold. This has been going on long enough though. I've burned through almost all of my influence at this point, and aside from the castles and cities, I have nothing to show for it. We still have over 1500 men in this army though, so I burned the rest of my influence on keeping the group together, and set a course for Lucan's last known location. As our cohesion continued to fall apart, we made it to Mysea. Lucan has long gone at this point, but we needed the influence to keep the group together. The battle for Mysea was pointless. We lost over 1,200 men in an attempt to take a city that we knew Lucan wasn't even at. Because of this, we were forced to disband the army while the nobles recovered from the immense losses we'd just incurred. On the bright side, we'd all be receiving tribute due to making peace with Sturgia. The next few days were chalked up to sitting around the city waiting for Hugh's soldiers to heal. There were well over 100 men in this party who were incapacitated from the assault. During that time, Garyos of the Western Empire decided to declare war on us, but Hugh wasn't swayed. Same with Sturgia. There's no reason to go after the West when our targets sat directly in front of us. Well, that is, until they try to take your cities from you. In which case, fuck em. We were able to break through the siege lines and get most of our troops into the city to defend from the West. I like to think I've got this down to a science, and that science is to simply find a catapult and fire it until they tear you away from it. Even though they were taking massive casualties, the West just wouldn't budge and eventually found themselves breaking down our front gates. Normally, I'd be a little nervous at this point, but Hugh was still full health and they were down to something like 25% of their assaulting forces. By the time they'd actually decided to retreat, we'd killed almost 400 of their men, while suffering less than 50 casualties. The aftermath of the battle was everything we needed, having brought us back up to over 200 influence. Hugh still had 50 wounded soldiers in his party, but with the West having been repelled, he could turn his focus back to Lucan. The first step was to simply find the man. From there, I could pull an army over and attack at the right time. We had intelligence that he had been seen near Odriza Castle, and so that's where we started out. After scouting the castle and confirming Lucan's party was hiding inside, Hugh called on four nobles to raise an army and begin preparations to siege. That was until Lucan made a run for it. We weren't at full capacity, but I wasn't about to let him get away again. You know what I thought. Sergeants in charge! Similar to his son, someone else had captured Lucan, causing me to move the entire army back to a controlled city, where he was dropped into one of Hugh's dungeons. It was finally over. Our revenge arc was, for the most part, complete. Almost eight years after starting this journey, we'd finally gotten our sweet, sweet revenge. Lucan's cities now belong to his sworn enemy in the Southern Empire. The heir to his throne was dealt with, his daughter married off, and his wife had been widowed. No.
now all that's left to do is to wrap up loose ends. For starters, one of our cities is under attack again. Looks like the city has been holding their own, so we just swooped in for the cleanup. Next on the list, Sionica. It's a beautiful port city with several prosperous villages tied directly to it. It's well fortified and heavily defended. It's the perfect target. Now, you may be wondering why I'm not pushing into the city as hard as I normally would, or have been doing in the past. Well, it's actually really simple. We need this to be a bloody shit show. Both sides need to suffer immense casualties. The reasoning? I want the city. Too long has Hugh Janus sat in silence while the Queen has passed over him, taking countless cities and castles for herself. With both sides weakened, I pulled our forces back, disbanded the army down to just my party, and began replenishing their lost troops. The goal was originally to leave the southern empire here, and then take the city for myself. But as soon as we dipped out, multiple western parties came to the defense of Zeonica, making it nearly impossible for us to siege it successfully. With that out of the equation, Hugh of House Janus chose to leave the Southern Empire of his own accord, keeping the two cities he'd been given, which pissed off the Queen enough for her to immediately declare war on him and his companions. That being said, we're up to Clan Tier 4 now, which means we can bring in yet another humble servant. And with a name like Gutrag Breakskull, I couldn't think of a better fit. The Southern Empire is way too big for us to fight, and I don't see a way that's even possible for us to walk away with a win. Because of this, we sought out an opposing general and paid a lump sum of 270,000 dinars to end the war outright, making this the first war in Calradia where not a single drop of blood was spilt. Finally at peace, Hugh returned home to converse with his wife, and together, on the 8th day of autumn, 1091, the creation of New Florida was solidified. King Hugh of House Janus would rule over New Florida for decades to come, cementing his name amongst the legends of Drew Peacock and Mike Oxlong. Through his rise to fame, King Hugh Janus was responsible for ending the lives of 659 soldiers, 28 bandits, 25 mercenaries, and 36 heroes. Most notable of those heroes were King Lucan and his son Osiron. Together, Hugh, his wife Zoanna, and their two children were finally at peace. Thank you all so much for watching. I've always wanted to make a Bannerlord video, and it took a lot for me to just say fuck it and try it out. As always, let me know what you liked and what you hated so I have something to work on for next time. A very special thank you to my YouTube members and Patreon supporters who make it possible for me to try out new concepts like this. I'm streaming over on Twitch now Monday through Friday in the evening, so if that's of any interest to you, come hang out with us for a bit. If you're anti-Twitch, I also post those VODs on my second channel the following morning. A link to both of these can be found on the screen in the next few seconds, as well as down in the description. Until next time though, I appreciate you all, stay safe, and thanks for stopping by.